Linux works the first time, so just want to say that. Uh, my name's Fabienne, or Fabienne, or Fobs, depending on what country we're in, and I guess we're in a fairly English-speaking part of a country that also speaks French, but um, it, it confuses the border guards when I come in with my American passport with a very French name. I had a very excited border guard, not this time, but last time, who rattled away in Canadian French, and I responded to her in Parisian French, and she, she looked just, just so confused why I would be coming up the West Coast with an American passport, but that's okay. I, I didn't show her the other passport, but it's, it's just fine. So my name's Fabienne. Um, I'm a Linux system administrator, building storage clusters, um, things like Ceph. Uh, I'm not in academia at the moment, so it's fun to be, ex it's exciting to be invited to what is largely an academic conference, so thank you. Uh, I also got invited to my first uh, mathematics conference next year. I have a math degree, but I've never been invited, so I, it's a whole new world for me. That's what you get when you start knitting. <laughs> so. I wanted to go back a little bit. Some of you may have seen my current project because I'm very loud about it, but we're going to go back a little bit in time to 1805, <laughs> if you'll indulge me, to the Jacquard loom. So they had these punch cards. I don't know how many of you have seen a Jacquard loom in person. That's good. That's a high number, actually. There are not that many of them left that are where you could see them. Um, so a jacquard loom has a one-to-one -one relationship between the holes that are punched in it and the pixels that are woven. This is not knitting, so we're going to jump between weaving and knitting, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, but you will, you will survive the ride. So they, the holes have a one-to-one -one relationship. If there's no hole, the needle doesn't go up and it doesn't change color. If there is a hole, the needle goes up and the resulting fabric changes color. Uh, this entire panel that you see here is one row of one repeat. So if we look at a finished uh, piece, what you're looking at is one line from here to where the pattern repeats, but only one line. So it's a very rudimentary form of storage, shall we say. And jacquard looms look a little something like this. They have uh, huge amounts of threads that pull on the fabric underneath, that pull up and down the warp threads. Here's one of the original uh, linotypes about the jacquard loom. And you'll see these huge racks of cards on each side. There's just massive amounts of data that had to be stored for what was uh, a repeating, rather simple fabric. Named for Monsieur Jacquard, Mr. Jacquard, who, uh, here's a portrait of him in 1839. If you look a bit more closely at this portrait, you'll notice that the portrait is woven on a jacquard loom, and in the background there is a jacquard loom, and he is measuring out a punch card. So this is a rather interesting portrait. These portraits, you could, I think there were five of them made. There, it took 24,000 of those jacquard punch hole cards to make this one image. And a few people owned these, and you think, oh, art collectors, uh, who could it have been? Well, this, of course, is Charles Babbage. He owned one of those. So we, this is the best animation that I could possibly have ever shown you. So this animation didn't exist until last year, uh, or this year even, and was made by Cindy Padua. She is a 3D modeler for movies. And you may be asking yourself, well, why is she modeling something as complex as something that was never built, uh, namely Babbage's analytical engine, which had engineering diagrams and engineering diagrams and engineering diagrams, and was never, ever built, not even to this day. There's the difference engine, which was completed after he passed away, but his analytical engine, which was his more complex machine that was capable of computing things. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and what we're looking at, the animation, is that very tiny bottom chunk, so a very simplified uh, reduction of how it worked. Uh, Sydney Padua made these out of the original engineering diagrams from Babbage. So she had to kind of sift through, because he would change his design pretty much once a month, like clockwork. So she sifted through all of his engineering designs to kind of make a, a final version, so to speak. So you may be asking yourself, why did she do this? Is she in academics? Does she do all of this for you know, some kind of interesting uh, conference? 
No, she did it for a graphic novel, which is remarkable. So I have it here. Um, her graphic novel is just gorgeous. If you haven't um, grabbed this yet, it is engineeringly accurate, like no graphic novel you've ever seen before. Um, and has beautiful, beautiful images in it. And what she's showing us here is actually the analytical engine, if it had been built in a you know, different universe with Babbage and Ms. Lady Ada Lovelace on the side working at the cards. So there's three sets of punch cards that uh, went into his theoretical analytical engine. And she describes them to us on a beautiful page of the book, which I'm going to just quickly. This is, this is important. So there were number cards that held the numbers to be used to run the calculation. There were variable cards, which is what we now call addresses. And there were the operation, operation cards, which held the instructions. And Babbage thought of the operation cards as, you know, adding, multiplying, but Ms. Lovelace thought otherwise. And that is why we are here today in the computer. So go buy the book. It's beautiful. Um, on a final, very related to your conference note, uh, these are her actual words, Ms. Lady Ada Lovelace. She says, the engine might act upon other things besides number, were objects found whose mutual fundamental relations could be expressed by those of the abstract science of operations, and which should also be susceptible of adaptations to the action of the operating notion and mechanism of the engine. Supposing, for instance, that the fundamental relations of pitched sounds in the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptions, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. So she just, she made up your career. So just saying that. Uh, she's holding there a, a long punched cards, a set of punched cards. She, uh, had seen a jacquard loom in her lifetime, or a very short lifetime. She died at 36, just before her 37th birthday. I'm 37 this year, so that's an important note. So, uh, and Babbage uh, didn't own a jacquard loom, but he did own that beautiful portrait of Mr. Jacquard and had seen a jacquard loom in working. So what is the legacy that we have today, or rather in 1901, uh, the punch paper tape with Bado encoding, uh, which was used on teletypes is actually still used and uh, I know my mom worked at the French embassy in San Francisco in the 70s and they still had a teletype running so and my husband introduced himself to me with his business card on a punch paper tape so that's really nerdy and in the center we have the IBM card which was invented in 1928 but used largely in the 50s and on the right we have something less important perhaps in the history of computing, but a brother knitting machine card from 1974. So where do, where do I stand in all of this? Well, I was invited to Amsterdam to uh, participate in a conference that I had participated in earlier in 2008, and I had built an interactive massage couch where the couch knows whether or not you're friended in a social network and gives you a longer massage so that you're encouraged to sit with someone you don't know. And the whole thing ran logging with CouchDB because I thought it would be hilarious to have CouchDB in a couch. <laughs> um, and the Art Institute who made this happen uh, called Mediamatic invited me back to do another round in 2010. And I, I forced, coerced uh, my friend Travis Goodspeed to come along with me and uh, build something weird. And we thought, oh, well, what if we, what if we build a kind of... A, I a bio tapestry that has to do with 8-bit video games. I don't know where this idea came from, but it came to us on the first day, on the brainstorm day. And that is where all good ideas or lifelong obsessions start, unfortunately. So uh, we went to the north of Holland and bought a knitting machine. The north of Holland is only about an hour away from Amsterdam, so don't worry, it wasn't very far. Um, we went and bought a knitting machine, and I knew how to hand knit, and I was a hardware hacker already at this point, and I could code but I really had no idea what I was up against. And in four days, we made a uh, project that we called Multi-Threaded Banjo Dinosaur Knitting Adventure 2D Extreme, which I'll come back to in a minute. It's a very, it trips right off the tongue. It's 
very easy title. Um, we bought a brother KH 930 because it had already been hacked and we thought, oh, that will be easy. It's already in the public domain. Brother doesn't make knitting machines anymore. This particular model, we know it'll work with this hack. Um, we didn't know how rudimentary the hack was. So a brother KH 930 is from 1981. It expects a floppy drive, which is a proprietary floppy drive in a proprietary format. Um, it has a maximum memory of 200 by 66 pixels, which We'll talk about this piece later, but this is eight times that amount of memory. Um, and it is derived largely from <coughs> their punch card line. So there, well, now we're back to the punch cards. So their punch card line, people still use um, knitting. These are consumer home knitting machines. Um, they still use Brother punch card knitting machines and other brands. There's a Singer couple of other ones. Um, but Brother had cornered the market. They had eight or ten different models of the punch card knitting machine in various widths and various special bells and whistles. And what it is is directly analogous to the jacquard loom. So knitting and weaving is not the same thing, just so that we're on the same page currently. But we, um, there's a one-to-one -one relationship with one uh, stitch with one hole in the punch card. So exactly as how the um, jacquard loom works, except in a 1980s Japanese engineered beautiful mechanical machine uh, that you could have at home, you have a pin that either goes through or doesn't go through a hole, which moves a needle on the needle bed, which either knits or doesn't knit a change in the color or the change in the texture in the fabric. Um, you'll notice that the punch card is not very wide and that the bed of needles is very wide. So what happens is it uh, repeats the pattern from the punch card. It reads hole by hole across the whole bed. So you have a repeated pattern sideways and then you have a changing pattern that you've punched into your card the long way. So if you, were to, if you wanted to knit something that changed slowly over time, you could make, in theory, a really, really large punch card. But these are largely punched by hand, and that's not very practical. If you bought a KH930 in 1981, you uh, would have entered the patterns, if you wanted to enter your own pattern. Usually you would go to the, your local yarn shop and buy a floppy disk with the newest patterns of the year, uh, which sounds terribly boring. But if you wanted to enter your own pattern, you would do so with these little tiny black and white pixel keys, which you see right to left of where it says input. And you would do that by hand for every single row without seeing whether you had input it wrong. <laughs> and then you would knit a test swatch of your very complicated thing that can only hold 200 by 66 pixels. So you're probably knitting a repeating pattern. Uh, there, were, there, there was a, a smarter way that Brother sold you on how to enter a pattern, and that was uh, with a joystick on your TV and you would scroll to the pixel and click it and then you would save that to their proprietary computer called a DAC and then you would save that onto your floppy and load it onto your machine. You can imagine that it'd be a little bit time consuming to do something non-repeating or programmatically derived. It's not really feasible at the time. So hack knitting machines were something that were relatively new when I was in Amsterdam in 2010. Uh, what people had been using was a closed source system where they sold you a USB to FTDI cable for $200 and a closed source Windows program for another $200 to use with your knitting machine to load in an arbitrary pattern. The problem was if you wanted to rotate an image in their software 90 degrees, everything skewed. So they didn't even have like, just 90 degree rotation wasn't part of their graphical program. Anyway, so it was not very, very easy to use. Most people hated it. So hack knitting machines came along fast and furiously. Uh, what it entails is the first hack was, which I used and extended, was a serial USB FTDI adapter and an emulator for a floppy drive in the terminal. So my scripted bash script can be a floppy drive and 
write something new to the machine, which was all good and everything except that it takes six button pushes on that really crazy keypad uh, with weird codes to be able to even load in the next chunk up to the memory of the machine. So I made a button pushing matrix, which is the simplest form of hardware hacking. It's very fun, and I highly encourage this. Um, button matrices are usually just row and column matrix encoding. If you've never hacked hardware, this is a good place to start. You take a multimeter and you start beeping and you make a chart like this one. Then you make yourself a, usually you scan all the boards because it's a lot easier to make notes on paper than on computers still. Um, so we have all kinds of things like uh, pull up resistors and the chunk that we're interested in to push the buttons on the machine are labeled there D2 to D11. And then you solder back into the board. Uh, we have to know where on the board that those happen, but that's what your multimeter's for. And you solder in a few more cables. It's really simple. And then you write some glue code. <laughs> so you write a wrapper script for what anybody had already hacked together. And you, you know, make something that will insert a little pattern. Well, it turns out that Travis Goodspeed and I, who made this little button pushing board for a row and column matrix control, there wasn't one already in open hardware. So we released the board. So this is actually a universal row and column matrix button pushing board, which you don't have to reinvent now. We've already released one. And it will work on any device that has a keypad that you want to brute force. And you're welcome. Hardware. So back to our game. In four days, we made the row and column matrix button pusher, but we also made an exhibit for this art event called Multi-Threaded Banjo Dinosaur Knitting Adventure 2D Extreme, uh, which started with an avatar creator uh, where you would log in with RFID. This whole festival was around these tiny passive RFID chips. So you would log in with RFID, make your avatar, play a game, and you played your game by moving your RFID pass actually over the bottom of the board to move the cursor of this top scroller video game, which had dinosaurs and banjos. Dinosaurs are bad and banjos are good. And if you won, your uh, avatar was then knit into a permanent record in the window of the art exhibit where it says, you beat Travis at such and such a time, your avatar was knit, and you were permanently recorded in the annals of <laughs> you've won multi-threaded banjo dinosaur knitting adventure 2D Extreme. Uh, we wrote up some documentation, which is nice. And later, the um, arts funding in the Netherlands got cut in half. So some of you may know this being in Europe, but the entire arts budget of the entirety of Netherlands from one year to the next uh, slashed. So Mediamatic, unfortunately, had uh, that knitting machine in its collection. And I said, well, I can free you of that knitting machine. So I bought it back. And I spent six months working full time on figuring out what I could do with a consumer hacked knitting machine. So I thought, well, I'll make a joke product um, for a product in Germany that we call Klubmate, which is a caffeinated, non-alcoholic, uh, fizzy beverage. Very caffeinated. And we all drink it. And I have, I'm back in the States for a year and a half now, so I'm, I'm off the Klubmate. I'm 100 and 400 days off Klubmate or something. I don't have a token or something, but it's very addictive. Um, but Berlin is very cold. So in the winter... Uh, people still drink Club Mata, but they want their hands to be warm. So we, um, so I thought, well, why don't you have a cozy that just goes over your Club Mata, keeps it, it stays cold, your hand stays warm, and it's a win-win. So I made these and went through and tested uh, QR codes and all kinds of other things along the way. But what's more important about this is that this is knit in a technique called double bed jacquard. So we're back to the word jacquard. This has nothing to do with the jacquard loom. Um, knitting machine parlance, double bed jacquard, is when you have a thick fabric that we would call in hand knitting parlance double knit. And it means the fabric stays very flat and you can knit arbitrarily large patches of one color without the fabric falling apart. So it's very important and it turns out that 
nobody else had gone to the trouble in the last 10 years of making a consumer knitting machine knit in double bed jacquard because it was so darn difficult to set it up. So I wrote up a pattern to share. So you can see that it, it's, it's rather esoteric. It says, change the tension on both beds to one, knit three circular passes, left, right, right, left, left, right, ending on the right side. Hang extra claw weights with carriage on the left. Set your 77 wide by 96 stitch long pattern in the knitting machine's memory with your hack machine setup or with your proprietary computer link. Use a pattern that is simply two color. The KH930 will automatically explode it into double bed card with the, with the KRC key. Press the KRC key. So there are all kinds of little weird things, that mechanical things that you had to do on the machine, like clear the lily knobs on the double bed, set the double bed tension lever back to one on the left, set the tension on both beds to one, knit two rows of rib. This is just to set up the machine to make it knit this fabric. Well, it turns out that people didn't use this to make clumaticosis, they used this to make double bed jacquard on their knitting machine. So it kind of exploded a whole new renaissance of people knitting different kinds of fabrics on their consumer knitting machines. So it goes to show that even if something is hacked, if there isn't the documentation there, tough luck on getting it to work. I went on a hunt after this because I was working on this full time for six months because I, I'm strange. And I, I thought I wanted patterns that looked really good in knitting uh, that would be easy to knit on a knitting machine with one bed without doing all the double bed jacquard fanciness. So I found a couple of um, pattern generators online that were meant for hand knitting, including this one that I have in my hand, which is a Scandinavian pattern generator, which is actually just a triangle of noise that's repeated around to make it look like a Scandinavian pattern. Um, but you could hide data in this. So in your triangle of noise, you could hide your private key or something. You could even, you could even knit that on the inside of the hat so that no cameras can take a picture of your obfuscated key. I, I know, I, I, maybe I had too much time on my hands in the six months. But anyway, this, this uh, other pattern generator that I have here is um, by Laura Kogler, and it was meant to make hand knitting more easy. So, but I, of course, used it for a knitting machine, and I made a morphing scarf where the pattern slowly changes very subtly over the length of the scarf. So kind of hard to see here, but there's kind of a pattern here, and if you follow it up, it becomes an X, or if you follow it back down, it becomes not an X. So it's changing by one pixel per block, per repeat, up the length of the scarf. So something that looks like it is uh, repeating is not, which I thought was interesting because knitting patterns are often repeating, mostly because they had that memory Mass, maximum memory of 200 by 66 pixels, or when you're hand knitting, you have a maximum memory of whatever you knit last. So if you put down your knitting and you want to pick it back up again, it's easier if you have a repeating pattern to read exactly what you already did. And this is what hand knitters actually do. They read their pattern off of what they've already knit to continue. Kind of like an algorithm, but in their head. So uh, what's interesting is that there's a, a website called Ravelry, and so I started putting up my... Um, thoughts there on knitting machine things. And there were some people that had put knitting machine stuff up on Ravelry, but it's mostly hand knitting and crochet. Beautiful community. Um, you can search by yarn, color, and type and pull up every single pattern that's ever been knit with it. Beautiful database. Gorgeous. Go check it out. It's free to join. Even if you don't knit, it's a really <laughs> fun thing to poke through. Lots of geeky stuff there. Uh, Klein bottle hats and all kinds of stuff. So after that, I wasn't satisfied with the kinds of patterns I was seeing to be able to knit on the knitting machine, I wanted something that was more complex, and I found this book through a friend called The Algorithmic Beauty of Seashells, which is an entire book of just algorithms that try to mimic nature for all different kinds of seashells, about 200 different seashells that are modeled in the book and in their code. And I picked one that I thought would look good, and no, I didn't pick Conus Textila, that would have been appropriate of me, but I didn't, wasn't really thinking about that at the time. I picked what is called the bat volute, or Symbiola vespertilio. And the code that comes with a book comes with basic, comes with compiled binary with basic, comes with Fortran and Java or something. And I thought, well, basic is the least annoying to deal with. So I tried to, <laughs> I tried to, I'm a mathematician after all. We don't have patience for coding languages, really. That's why, that's why we do Lisp. So the, 
the basic wouldn't recompile in any modern basic compiler, and I tried about 12. Uh, so I had to use their static binary, and I just dealt with it. So I generated these and knit them. So this piece was the first one, which is as large as this one. Um, not only is it a different color, it's a different output of the algorithm. So they're all provably unique. They're all different. So they look similar, but they're all different. Nobody has the same one. Well, nobody has any others of these because it took me eight hours on the machine to knit this because it's very time consuming. So um, I knit myself a black and white one, which I eventually gave to my sister and took back, which you'll see why in a minute. And I kind of left it at that. And this was a few years ago, and I thought, okay, it's just, this is my art side project, It'll, it's fine, I work as a Linux system administrator, I'm unfortunately very hireable as a Linux system administrator. Um, people always need storage. So I thought, oh well, that's the end of it. But in between all this adventure, I found that people were getting back to me and they were said, well, thank you for releasing your code, and uh, I ended up using your stuff in this way. And uh, one of those people were Mar Kane and Varvara Gulieva, who Mar emailed me at 2 in the morning, and he was in Europe and I was in Europe. And I thought, wow, what is this other insomniac doing with knitting machines? And he said, uh, I desperately need your button pushing matrix um, schematic because I'm doing a hand soldered version. I said, no, we release boards. He said, no, 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 I have this art exhibit tomorrow. And I said, okay, well, it sounds like a typical computer person. I said, okay. Um, here, and I walked him through, and I said, well, what are you doing with it? And he said, well, I'm using it to brute force my machine, because I don't have a KH930, I have another model, and it's not susceptible to the hack that you used. So I'm brute forcing loading in the um, design, pixel by pixel. Um, I wrote some code for it, and I said, great. I said, how long does it take to load in a pattern? He said, overnight. I said, okay, <laughs> that's great. Mine takes about 10 seconds with my you know, fake floppy drive in the terminal, but that's cool. I said, well, what are you making with that? And he said, spam poetry sweaters. And I said, you are my friend. <laughs> so he and Varvara made a beautiful project called um, Spam Poetry, which is not just the one sweater you see on the side, but many sweaters, it turns out. And later, they became so obsessed with uh, knitting machines that they re um, released an open source drop-in replacement, which makes is way better than my hack. If you're writing down links, I have like a master link list at the very end because they're, you're about to be bombarded with a lot of links. There's a paste bin with every single link that I'm showing, so you could be saved the trouble. If you want to write things down, that's cool too, I, I get it. Um, so they put in this drop-in replacement which uses an Arduino with a shield and actually takes away the memory requirement of the 200 by 66 pixels, which means you can knit arbitrarily long things. And their project is open source hardware, open source software, and became very, very popular well, along came another group, and they said, well, that's very nice, but we would like to target machines that haven't spiked in price on eBay since you released your code. Thank you for that. <laughs> and I said, okay, um, what machines are you targeting? They said, the KH910. I said, that one's not hackable. And they said, oh, yes, it is. We've done it. Um, and we're going to release our board for it. It's also open source. Um, and we're doing everything in the command line because you inspired us to stay in the command line and not make a GUI. And I said, thank you. <laughs> uh, I, maybe a lot of people who wanted GUIs are sad, but yes. So they stay in the, which is great, because then we can script pipe in things and everybody's happy. So they made an open source drop-in replacement there in Germany. Uh, you can buy the boards from them or you can um, have your own boards printed. It's fully open hardware, open software. And another project came along and said, Fabienne, I'm, we're doing double badge of card with all these colors. And I said, that's not possible. And they said, no, we made software. And I said, cool. So they're a closed source um, software project that is way better than the closed source software project that came before us, which is why I'm mentioning them now. And those two things are actually knit on a consumer knitting machine, which is amazing. And along came someone named Gerard Rubio who said, well, that's nice, but I don't want to buy a 1980s knitting machine. I want to print my own on my 3D printer. And I said, that's nice. I built three 3D printers and none of them work, but good luck. And he said, I have a working one. I said, you're, you're a god among men. That's great. So he made a fully open source knitting machine with open source de design files, open source hardware, and open source software. 
uh, that's fully reproducible, printed on a RepRap. It doesn't do color changing, but it does have a motor, so there's no more hand cranking across the bed of needles. You can set it, forget it, come back, and there's a fully knit sweater, which is really cool. He partnered with Nitic, that first pair of artists who did the spam poetry and that later did a drop-in replacement uh, for the firmware for his machine, and they said, we want to build a 3D printable knitting machine, we'll build a circular one. So they did. So this is a fully 3D printable and laser cuttable uh, open hardware motorized circular knitting machine. Again, no color changing, but uh, beautiful tubular work, which is good for sleeves, scarves, anything you want to lay flat that is knit in single knitting. And a crazy friend of mine named Clement uh, said, that's all very nice with your knitting machines, but I can't afford a spinning wheel right now, but I have five working 3D printers. And I said, how? And he said, I'm the maintainer of RepRap. And I said, oh. And uh, he said, I'm, I love spinning, but it's too expensive. So I made a 3D printable spinning wheel that's controlled with a 555, which is very simple hardware for those of you hardware nerds. Um, and he didn't win the 555 contest with us. This is probably the best example I can think of for the 555 contest. But anyway, so he made this, and it's released, and that's great. And more and more people were contacting me. And at one point, um, a woman named Leah Alba contacted me and said, well, I'm getting into industrial knitting machines. And I said, wow. OK, uh, aren't those really expensive? She said, oh, I'm at an institute, and I have access to them. I said, dang, I wish I had access to them. Why didn't I stay in academia? But um, she just released a talk last week called From Text to Textiles, which is beautiful, which you'll have the link again at the end in the master link list. Uh, this image that you see here is the coding language for an industrial knitting machine today. This should make you want to cry. So she has started working on, she has a whole bunch of pseudocode examples, and she's starting to work on um, scripting industrial knitting machines, which is really important. She has a, a bunch of side projects that are beautiful on her blog. Um, including uh, fabric generation to print on spoon flour to make your own fabric using 10 print, which is great. If you haven't read the 10 print book, that's another great free book that you can get. Side note. So in all of this, I, I had gone through this journey, kind of put things aside, and then um, the very favorite thing that I had knit were um, elementary cellular automata. They looked really cool in knitting, very simple. But yet they had generative patterns that would go all along the length of a long scarf. And it's what had originally inspired me to figure out how to do double bed jacquard. Because if you have a big patch of color at the beginning of your knitting, and you do that in single-sided knitting, even if you fold it back and sew it to itself, it loses its structural integrity along the color change edge of the big block of color. So I had played with some stuff. This is in processing. I know I said mean things about Java earlier, but processing is okay. So um, I'm really platform agnostic, so it's, you, I, you can't have a religious war with me. I do all the things. So we have, um, I, I started generating things for scarves, and then I realized that this was really cool. And people said, well, where can I buy one? And I said, well, if I knit it on my knitting machine and I sell it to you on Etsy, it's going to cost about $500, because that's how much time it takes me to actually finish a piece. Uh, but they were really cool, as in none of the scarves were the same. So these are rule 110, which is the rule that's provably Turing complete, uh, proven by Matthew Cook, um, who later came in contact with me with my project. So we're going to be collaborating soon on other algorithms to knit, which is really exciting. I had a fangirl moment when he contacted me. I was like, are you the Matthew Cook? And he said, yes. And I said, I have a mathematics degree, and I think you're the best thing since light spread. And he said, oh, uh, I'm in Switzerland, but we can collaborate over email. And I said, great. So that was great. I don't fangirl over a lot of celebrities, so that was good. Um, and one of the things I made, which I'll pass around here, is this Rule 73 scarf. Rule 73 is not everybody's favorite rule. It's just rather interesting because it works really well on single bed knitting, works well double bed jacquard. Um, exhibits chaos in certain widths. Of course, I knit it in widths that exhibited chaos. And the scarf you're seeing has actually two uh, generations with different, row, uh, different starting rows 
on each side. So the two sides are actually unique as well. And I thought, well, if I have to sell these, I have to do this last row, what I call the last row problem. <laughs> when you have a consumer knitting machine, it can't geometrically be able to do the last row automatically for you. You have to take it off the machine and cast off by hand, uh, which is not even with knitting needles. You have to do a stitched bind off if you're doing double bed jacquard. We'll stay out of knitting technology here, but it's very, very time consuming. So a thing of this width, this last row takes about six hours. I didn't want to pay somebody to do that, and I didn't want to do it myself. And I thought the only way to get around this was to have an industrial knitting machine. And this, this kind of was my ideal, beautiful thing. Someday somebody will let me use their industrial knitting machine. Well, anybody who knows me, I'm a hardware hacker. They're not going to let me touch their industrial knitting machine. <laughs> I asked Nike Research Lab, very nicely. I asked uh, people in academia who had access to one, and they said, well, we have, we have a lab, but we can't tell you what machines we have. Which one do you want to use? And I said, no, I want to try them all. And they said, no, you have to you know, apply for this and this. And I, I, I kind of lost time on academic red tape. And so eventually, this year, I thought, what if I, what if I really, really did get my own industrial knitting machine? <laughs> so I started a Kickstarter. <laughs> Uh, it turns out the break-even on Kickstarter with all the fees, taxes, cost of yarn, cost of shipping, cost of the knitting machine is $100,000. <laughs> it's a lot for your minimum to raise on Kickstarter. Um, there are only 2,100 projects that have ever made it to 100000 on Kickstarter. Um, but I didn't know this at the time. And I spent three months, I started a business, I got a CPA, I went and met with other people who had successful Kickstarters, and thought, oh, this will be easy, this will be, no. It was crazy battle, um, but it worked. So I started a Kickstarter called Knit Yak, and the reason it's called Knit Yak is because, don't yak shave, Knit Yak, <laughs> and because the dot-com was free, don't, don't judge me. So I put together what was arguably one of the nerdiest Kickstarters known to mankind where I describe how uh, elementary cellular automata works, how it is not Conway's game of life, how that's a two-dimensional cellular automata, and how elementary cellular automata is a one-dimensional cellular automata, and how it works, and how you can generate your own, and here's some code, and here's a GIF of this thing generating, and here's the code that I used to generate the GIF, and you get the point. I was very, very nerdy. And I thought, well, this will either work or it won't. This will either make it big in the huge market of knits for mathematicians, or it won't. <laughs> uh, I also released the pattern. I thought, well, I can't do open source because I'm buying a machine that a company is going to sell me, and they're going to be very sad if I open source their machine right away. Um, so I didn't put open source anywhere in the description, which is very strange. And I, I, I kind of glossed over the fact that I was a hardware hacker. I said, I modified machines. So it, it's very fluffy uh, kind of a parlance. And I released in the public domain the actual code that I was going to use to generate the scarves. Well, it got a little bit of press. <laughs> so it kind of went crazy. My favorite dichotomy is Scientific American and Glamour magazine <laughs> on the same day. I was completely blown away by Scientific American and mystified by Glamour magazine. I think, I think under Glamour Magazine it was kick-ass women Kickstarters that you should fund today. And on Scientific American it was mathematicians, here's the thing. I was like, okay, <laughs> it was great. But it worked um, because I got funded to the tune of $124,000. So it, there's some demand for elementary cellular automata scarves. <laughs> <laughs> now we have proven that and nobody can deny me that particular... Uh, badge of honor. Um, during the funding, it went over so much that I could uh, stretch beyond just black and white and add in a second color. And people were like, well, why didn't you offer 12 colors? That would have been better. And I said, well, the yarn that I'm buying comes in 100-pound pallets. And I've calculated that for my break-even of 100,000 on Kickstarter, that is 638 scarves, which is 398 pounds of yarn, which means 
200 pounds of black and 200 pounds of white. I said, if I stretch beyond that, I can't make a profit or even break even, and I will be forever in the poorhouse, which is fine, but I didn't want to be that much in the poorhouse. And I eventually, I had a dream number where I knew that I could add in a, a third color but the third color means that if it's blue, then you could have blue and black or blue and white. So it essentially makes three colorways for the price of one extra color of yarn. So currently, the people who uh, funded the Kickstarter are voting on the color. Uh, but of course, I couldn't just let it be straight votes. It had to be weighted with how much they uh, pledged. So I have a massive spreadsheet that takes this really ugly data that Kickstarter gave me in a CSV file and magically tells me which color is winning. So as of this morning, purple is at 22%, green is at 16%, and gray is at 14%. So I was very mystified by this because gray, why, if you already had black and white as a choice, why would you choose gray? Well, it turns out mathematicians like subtlety. <laughs> So in closing, I have all of the links for the talk. I have uh, everything is uh, under a Creative Commons attribution share like 4.0 international license, which means you can do whatever you would like with the slides um, and take the links, do what you will with them, hack your own knitting machines, hack the planet. Thank you for having me. Any question? And we should repeat the question in the microphone yes. so that it will be recorded. Yes. Questions? Yes. What's next after this? What's next after this? Uh, so this is, a rad this is my business now. <laughs> so I have a mathematical and scripted business, which is weird that I'm not consulting somebody on code, but making fashion. Um, I need to build a room for this knitting machine because it requires high humidity and uh, temperature control. So I built a thing called the Orchidarium, which is an orchid growing case with open source hardware. So I'm building an HVAC system out of that um, to control the knitting machine. And of course, I'm a sysadmin, so there will be alerts to my phone and my email uh, when something goes wrong, either with the knitting or with the humidity or when we have that final big earthquake in Seattle that everybody's been talking about. That's what's next. Oh, and there's an eight-week training course on the machine because their uh, software is so obtuse that they can't release a manual. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to do that training, which is from mid-October to mid-December. It's in Germany. And I'm doing it in German because the English class is full. So thank goodness I lived in Germany. And I can speak German, so that's good. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. So he was, yeah, he was mentioning that Sydney Padua, who wrote this beautiful book that I quoted Ms. Lovelace from, who did she amazing amount of research for a graphic novel. I've never seen something this way. And the footnotes are glorious in this book. You, you must read the whole thing. Um, so she's going to be speaking in which month? Uh, 9th and 10th of December. 9th and 10th of December in, in Oxford. Okay. So, yeah, she's based in London. Go check out her talk. Any other questions? So uh, I just have a quick question. How many people knit? OK. How many people weave? Those, the machines are a lot bigger, so it's OK. You're allowed to. Uh, how many people do hardware? OK. And you all code. So that's interesting. Cool. That was for my personal edification. Yes. Pardon? Are you 
Am I hiring? Uh, <laughs> ask me in a year. <laughs> so my CPA said don't hire anyone for the first year. Uh, just try to break even. And he was shocked that my Kickstarter made it because he's a very old school CPA. And he said, well, you know, your goal, Fabian, is 100000 and I don't, I don't think that's very realistic. And I said, when have I ever done anything realistic? <laughs> This is functional programming yes. in art, and in front of you, you have functional programmers. Yes. Or also functional fans, or whatever it means. Uh, what, what could you need from them? Yes, so I did put out a bounty for um, making a QR code reader that can read QR codes on knitting. And it's actually a very simple to do item for you. Um, and it is Basically, you just need uh, some kind of fuzziness to an image. So the pixels need to look less like pixels and more like blobs. So it's not a very difficult programming task. But I, d I did put out a bounty on it. Nobody took me up on it. I, I offered them a free piece of knitting art of their desire. So if you do do that, um, I would like it to be able to feed into an Android QR code reader of some sort. Um, but it would make so that you could uh, read QR codes and knitting without being in the dark and without having a very bad camera phone. Yes? The program is pretty well just beyond. I sort of imagine it might speak or what kind of language are you using? What? Yes, so I haven't um, decided on my final language. I code in Clojure, Lisp, Scheme, C, many things. Uh, processing? It won't be in processing. Python? I love Python. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do realize who my audience is. So yes, I, I don't know what the final coding language will be. Uh, my hope is that my hope, I have promised to my Kickstarter backers that they will be able to pick out the exact scarf they want um, by picking out the exact seed row and width. So I, I won't know the width of the scarf until I get the machine, until I know what the tensions are like with the yarn that I've picked. There's a lot of chicken and egg going on, but I won't know until I physically have a $60,000 industrial knitting machine in front of me and 400 pounds of wool, how wide the code has to be in pixels. Yes? So I can see this be a bridge for people like me who program, who don't know anything about the lyrics, who get into that, uh, and there's plenty of people who are pretty good at teaching people the lyrics and teaching people programming. Um, I can see people learn. Yeah. Um, well, I think we're doing not so well in teaching people to program. Yes. Nowadays. Yes, so the question was how to teach people um, how to program using fabric and textiles as a medium to teach them. Uh, there's some great people doing work in this um, realm. I run a little conference called Hard Hack, which is hands-on hardware hacking. And I ran a little conference about textile uh, computing and textiles. So for both of those, I invited people who came and showed people whether it was with hardware, Arduino, scripting Arduino for the hardware, or whether it was uh, my friend Martin, who uh, has a turtle style, logo style, uh, hand stitching generator uh, work. And he taught people who have never coded to uh, generate shapes, and generate patterns uh, using code in about two hours, which they then hand embroidered onto fabric. And it's beautiful work. Uh, I will I will include that in the link list. It's not it wasn't in my talk because I tried to keep it mostly to knitting machines. But there are a lot of people who are doing textile, coding, scripting, and I, I think it's a great gateway or gateway drug. Textiles are very addictive. It's a very it's a very nice way to get people into programming. Good question. Any more questions? Well, I'll be here all day if you want to nerd out with me uh, or ask me more details about what went on. Uh, or what I'm doing, feel free to come find me. Thank you so much for having me.